Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Friday one-hour special presentation of Women of Grace. I'm Johnette Williams. It's always a grace and a joy to be with you, and we've got quite a program lined up for you. Do you believe in miracles? Have you ever witnessed one? Has God used you as an agent of his healing power? Today's guest would answer yes to each of these questions. Sister Bridge McKenna is a religious sister of St. Clair who has traveled the globe for Jesus, bringing his healing love to countless numbers of people. In every place, she has witnessed varieties of miracles in a variety of forms. From physical healings to deep and intense spiritual healings, Sister Breeze has been a conduit of God's grace. She'll share with us today about the gift of healing that comes by way of the Holy Spirit. Sister Breeze McKenna was born in County Armagh, Ireland, and entered religious life on her 15th birthday. Within a few short years, she was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and told little could be done for her. But at 9.15 a.m. on December 9, 1970, God miraculously healed her condition. And that's just the beginning of her story. In her book, Sister tells us about the incredible signs and wonders she has witnessed in her ministry of healing, which has taken her around the globe. She's with us today to tell us about the amazing and incomparable love of God through whom all good things come. Let's welcome Sister Breege McKenna, who is the author of this book, Miracles Do Happen, which chronicles many of the miracles and interventions of God that she's witnessed in her ministry. Sister Breeze, welcome. It's so good to have you with thank us. Thank you, Jeanette. I'm so happy to be with you on Women of Grace. Well, thank you so very much, Sister. And I was sharing with you before the program started that when this book first came out, I read this book. And I haven't reread it until I was preparing for our program today. And I sat there in absolute amazement and was so deeply touched by God because on every page we see his mercy, we see his love, we see his forgiveness, uh, and we see the marvelous ways in which he wants to act in our lives. And because spiritually, I'm not in the same place as I was, hopefully all those yes. years ago, it hit me at a new depth. So thank you so much for writing it. I really appreciate well, it. Well, I'm so happy, and I'm so happy that after all these years, Jeanette, it is still, uh, been used by the Lord around the world. It's in like 40 language more, languages and dialects. And But um, I keep saying, I must read it again myself. <laughs> I did read it not too long, about six or seven years ago, but, you know, I'd need to again. But it was written in, I was telling you, it was written in five days. Yes, I know, that's incredible. Yes, and I, I was recently talking to a priest, you know, who came to see me and he was telling me how he, he slaved over his book for 17 years. And he said to me, Sister, you wrote a book. How long did it take you? And I felt so embarrassed because <laughs> I thought, well, he's brilliant, you know. And his was very scholarly. Well, I said, Father, all mine is is stories about Jesus and my faith. I said it took five days. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, the thing of it is, uh, when God wants a work done, he makes certain it gets done. Yes, exactly. And he wanted this done. And friends, we want to let you know that it's available for you at EWTN's religious catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. I like to call it the home of holy reminders in memory of our foundress, Mother Angelica. Get a copy of this book. I'll tell you, it will revolutionize your life. And you've heard that over and over again, that people have read this book, and they have experienced a profound depth of God's mercy in their own lives through reading it. Yes, I, I've heard, uh, uh, Jeanette, I heard one of the most beautiful stories I heard. It's humorous, but it's, it's, he was very honest to tell me. I was in England uh, ministering. You know, I do a lot of ministry to priests for many years with the late Father Kevin and now Father Pablo. But um, a priest, uh, a bishop came to see me, an auxiliary bishop in I think, some part of England. And he said to me, you know that book you wrote? He said, I have to tell you about it. He said, Unfortunately, I hadn't read it when this, miracle, when this miracle happened. He said, but I had a priest in with me, and he was leaving, and he was just had had it. And I was trying to think, oh, what will I give him? What will I say to him? And he said, my eye caught this book on my shelf. Miracles do happen. <laughs> so I said, Father, take this and read it. So he said, the priest looked at him in total disgust. A nun's book? So he took the book, and, he, and then the priest told me the story as well. So he took the book home with him and he put it in the shelf and he had his mind made up. But then one night he had everything packed, how God works, and uh, he couldn't sleep. And he l looked at the book and he thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll read something uh, of this thing that'll help me. <laughs> and he told me, 
that the first chapter Jesus appeared to him in the room. He said, and said something to him, and he said, I couldn't leave the book down, and he said, I, f I rediscovered my priestly vocation. And I said, well, that's the best miracles. And those kind of miracles I hear a lot of, you know, of the people say to me about the Eucharist, because mm -hmm. I keep thinking, you know, it's very, it can be very easy for Jesus to do physical healing. Mm -hmm. It is. But to get people to believe in the mysteries, yes. you need faith. But if this generates that faith, that's my prayer for the book. And that's what it's been doing. Oh, it has been doing that, Sister. I want to talk a little bit about that moment of encounter that you had with Jesus back in December of 1970. I know you have the date very well. <laughs> yes, I found it in your book, Sister. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, here's the thing. Uh, here you were. You were this young religious sister that was sent by your provincial to the United States, to Tampa, Florida. You were teaching first graders, yeah. right? Oh, I'll tell you the true story. Were you? What, what, uh, yes, but tell me the school. What school were you St. Lawrence's. Okay, St. Yeah. Lawrence's. Oh, I know where that well, is. Well, you okay. know, um, I entered, I, I, I left home at 14 mm -hmm. and uh, because they told me to come back later. So I'm back two weeks later after I was 14 and they took me in and then I got my postulants outfit when I was 15 professed when I was 16. But when I got the arthritis, I got stricken with crippling rheumatoid arthritis, I realized that I would have been sent home had I not been professed. But since I was already professed, what could they do? They would keep me. <laughs> so it came to the uh, time for my final virus, 21, and uh, we had a convent in Florida. And it's good to tell people this because people think, you know, that when you talk about going on a mission, Florida was a mission at the time. But I really didn't go to Florida because I really loved Jesus and I wanted um, to leave Ireland and all. This nun came home from America and she, they were looking for sisters to go to Florida. And people were very hesitant, they could volunteer. And she said to me, you know, Sister Breach, Florida would be perfect for your arthritis. Beautiful. Really good for you. So I thought, would well, that be great? Because the pains, I had terrible pain in my feet. So I left Ireland and the old habit to come to Florida so the sunshine of the sky would heal me. And I arrived in Tampa in September 1967. And I thought when I got off the plane, this has to be hell. <laughs> this is the worst place. And we had no air conditioning. <laughs> so hot. It was so in hot. September. And I cried for two weeks and then... I was told, well, you have to offer it up. And it was the most terrible experience for the first two years because of, you know, can you imagine the heat and rheumatoid arthritis? Yeah. But Jesus brought me there because this encounter I had, uh, um, thank God that um, I came to America as a young girl at that age because I think, you know, that you can, I was very happy in religious life and sure I loved Jesus, but I wasn't on fire. I did my work and it was just like a job, you know, say your prayers, get everything done. But then uh, people started leaving religious life and the priesthood and, you know, you begin to question. And I thought, well, it could happen to me. And the this crisis came not, it wasn't a, a, a crisis of my vocation, but it was a crisis of saying, I don't really know Jesus personally. And I encountered the charismatics. I was afraid of them. And I thought, well, we don't pray like that. We pray out of a book. <laughs> but, you know, if you go close to a fire, you'll burn. I kept going back to prayer meetings. And then I realized, I will, I'll go through my religious life lukewarm if I don't really experience Jesus. And, you know, Pope John Paul, and which we so many you hear saying, you know, a personal encounter with the risen Jesus or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I ended up saying. I could be a saint in a wheelchair. And I remember making the decision and saying, I would hate to spend my whole life as a young nun. Uh, it's like being married to a man and you don't really love him. And you live with him, but you're not in love with him. I thought, here, I have a ring on my finger and I'm not madly in love with Jesus. I, I don't know whether I'd die for him. And so I always tell people, there's one thing I'm very sure of. I'm not always sure people are going to get healed the way they want, but I am very sure, and I'd say that to your listeners, that if you want to meet Jesus and you, you want to know Jesus and you want to experience Jesus, that's his will. That's the Father's will that you know. And he said, 
what do I do? You know, in the scriptures, uh, believe in the one he sent. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I went away on a retreat. Um, I, it was uh, charismatic over in Orlando. And I said, I was born on the Feast of Pentecost Sunday. It was my feast day. And I thought, now, I'm going to sit in the very front. So if this Holy Spirit is going by, <laughs> I get it. I want it. <laughs> I want it. A double portion of it. <laughs> And it was a quarter to nine, as you said, and the priest, Father Ed O'Connor from Holy Cross in Notre Dame. So he was given beautiful teachings on the Catholics, you know, sure we're baptized, because, you know, we're always defense, so we are baptized, and, you know, we know Jesus, but there's a difference in knowing about him and knowing him. So he said, it's like having a birthday gift. If you don't open the birthday gift and look at the wrappings, what good is it? Because it's the interior what's in there and he said that's the same with the sacraments he made it very acceptable for to be able to see that it wasn't something different it was catholic but it was just opening to the grace of the holy spirit to understand the sacraments of our church mm -hmm. and i said that's what i want so i closed my eyes and I said i don't want i don't know if i'll ever get healed i maybe i'm going to be in a wheelchair but you can be a saint but i will never reach holiness if I'm just lukewarm and I'm, I'm not full of zeal. So I, I closed my eyes and I remember saying, Jesus, I just want to know you, please, Jesus. And the moment I was pleading like a person for water, you know, you're thirsty. And I, I remember, I can still remember it with my eyes closed here, this big bang in my head. I thought the priest came over to me, he's way over the other side. He was like a kangaroo, how do you get over here? And I opened my eyes to look up at him. And I was being healed. Oh, my goodness. And I jumped up. And, you know, Catholics are not too expressive in church, like jumping up. And I was praying away and singing to God, saying, Jesus, I know you're here. And a man beside me said, are you feeling all right, sister? <laughs> and the arthritis left me. But that wasn't the best part. The best part was I fell in love with a person. Yes. And from that day, Jeanette, I, I told somebody recently, I've lived now for 62 years. This is my Diamond Jubilee year. Next door to the person that I love, Jesus. And I said, it's the best life to think that you're living body, blood, soul, and divinity next door to God. And so that's what happened to me that day. It changed my whole life. Of course, I had to realize like a fire that, you know, when the fire starts burning, you have to keep putting coal on it. Yes, that's so, right. So, of course, that was my prayer life. And I... I have, you know, I love adoration. I spend a lot of time in adoration, and I tell people, this is the best way. Go in and talk to Jesus. Don't be telling him nice things. Just, he's a person. <laughs> so, so that's how it all happened. And then, of course, the doctor declared, the doctor cried. He was from down there in Bayshore in Tampa. And he said, I'd love to take the credit for your healing. I could be famous, but he said, I believe in Jesus too. Oh, my goodness. Sister, it's a remarkable story, and God had remarkable things in mind for you. And when we come back from our break, let's pick up with some of those remarkable things and how it was that the Lord began to share with you what it was he wanted you to do, and you were kind of like, oh, I'm not sure I want to exactly. do this. More back with Sister Breeze in just a moment, inviting you to get out to EWTN's religious catalog. It's EWTNRC.com. Her book, Miracles Do Happen, has sold millions of copies. We figure it's got to be at least a million, probably more, 40 different languages, continue continues, continues to be a blessing to those who read it. It certainly has blessed me. Get a copy of this for yourself and everybody that you know, because God will work through it. It's called Miracles to Happen by our guest today, Sister Breeze McKenna. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back, everybody. We're visiting with our guest today, Sister Breege McKenna. She is the author of Miracles Do Happen. So many of you are very well acquainted with Sister Breege and the great way in which God uses her. He's given her the gift of healing, and truly, indeed, she has witnessed miracles that are absolutely amazing, astonishing. And if you never believed in God before, you would believe in God once you began to see what God does in her and does through her. We sure do want you to get a copy of her book. She chronicles a lot of the miracles that she has seen. Miracles of 
of, uh, that are physical in nature, but as Sister so beautifully puts it, you know, the ones that take place in the heart, conversion of heart, uh, the healing of, of deep issues, that is when you really know that the Holy Spirit is doing something dramatic in the life of an individual. So get on out there. You can read about the stories. More than that, you'll be abundantly blessed by the book, Miracles Do Happen by Sister Breeze McKenna. EWTNRC.com. That is the home of Holy Reminders, EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. Order a copy for yourself and everybody you know and love because they will love this book too. You know, Sister, we went to the break and you shared with us about that remarkable moment where you were healed of your rheumatoid arthritis. You had been in a wheelchair, right? Your no, feet were was, deformed. It wasn't completely in it, but I was in it for two years over in Ireland. Yes. And your feet were deformed. Yes, my feet were, yeah. And your hands were not deformed, but you were no, having problems with there, them. Yes, and, and I had pain. My knees were very swollen and... You yes, know, the arthritis. But like that, the Lord healed you instantly. Instantly. But, uh, but as the doctor said to me, he when the doctor looked at me when I went back, he said, you know, the healing took place in your physical, but it's bigger in your spiritual. Because, you know, when God touches you, yes, if if you're open, it changes everything, your conscience and everything. Yes, you know. It, it, it is true, and people don't realize, I think that we don't realize strongly enough, maybe you do because of the work that you do, but that connection between the spirit and the body, oh, yes. there's a direct correlation there. Oh, if yes, you're sick in spirit, yes. you're going to be sick in body. If you're not yes. yet, you will be soon. Yes, yeah. yeah. And you can be very, you can have physical sickness, and because, you know, that's what I tell people, that, um, you know, I've, I've prayed with a lot of people, and I've seen them being transformed spiritually, but still maybe have the pain and I always think what Mother Angelica said to me mm -hmm. you know I used to come here a lot and um, when when this book was coming out Mother, I was talking to Mother Angelica and she made the point that you know when you meet people who are suffering you know terrible pain mm -hmm. and that um, she, she used to say in her own amiable way she'd say <laughs> Who wants the stigmata? Oh, big holes in your hands. She said, oh, it's bleeding and everything. She said, it doesn't mean a thing if your heart is not in love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And she said, the stigmata can be cancer, leukemia, a child. That's a, she said, it's, it's what you do with the suffering. It's what that's you do right. with that pain. And so that also is, is part of where I see a lot of people um, get great, great graces from me telling them this, you know, when I say to them, you know, look at, I pray, I know miracles happen, I know, I've seen them. Just a few days ago, somebody came and told me how they were miraculously healed. But you wanted to ask me the question about how I got into the ministry. Well, yes, because <laughs> after that amazing moment that you experienced there in Orlando, Florida, at that charismatic conference, um, and, and that beautiful event, it was Father Ed O'Connor. Yeah, said, we were right? at Mass, we were just starting the Mass, he was, yeah. Yeah, and, and all of this transpired, and then the Lord came to you, with basically a request because he never forces us, but he made his will known to you. Yes. Well, when I got healed, I never told anybody because um, being Irish, I thought, you know, they started attaching cures because where I lived in Ireland, you know, they had cures for everything. And uh, it's a, such and such one is a cure. And, you know, whether superstitious or what, but anyway. Um, so I thought, mm, the charismatics will definitely come after me if I... <laughs> if I say anything. So I never said anything. And I, um, about my own physical healing, because I didn't want, I love teaching and I thought, oh, it'd be too sensational. And, you know, it, it was really selfish because I didn't want to be bothered. Anyway, I was, it was Pentecost Sunday. I was on Saturday night before Pentecost. And I thought, the first Pentecost that I was healed, and since it was my, you know, my church birthday, I was born on the feast, so I thought, about 11.30 at night, I got this idea. I can't say it was a revelation, an idea. You know, you get an idea to do something. I thought, you know, it would be nice to make a holy hour for um, Pentecost. And then part of me saying, but I could make it tomorrow. But I went in to the chapel, and I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm not really in a big spiritual experience. I'm just sitting looking at the tabernacle, just like this. The nuns are all in bed. It's a bit nearly 12 o'clock, and my parish priest was always saying to me after my miraculous healing and after they knew I was in the charismatics, and he would be saying to me, hello, teasing me, you know, hello, Breach, how is God? <laughs> I'd say, he's wonderful. When did you talk to him? He said, did you hear any voices? <laughs> well, this Pentecost night, when I'm sitting there, I hear this voice, and the voice said, Breach. 
I turned around and thought one of the nuns came in, and at that moment the voice said, you have my gift of healing, go and use it. And this, it, it was not a, 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 extraordinary in one way, but it was just a flash, like a, a surge of heat and electricity went through my hands and left, and everything's over. And I knelt down and I thought, hmm, Father wasn't far wrong. I'm hearing <laughs> the voices. And I looked at the tabernacle, and in all sincerity, I can still hear my sister saying, Jesus, I don't want any gift of healing. You keep it yourself. I don't want it. Poor Jesus. <laughs> so then I said an act of contrition, not for what I said, but for the thought. How proud to think that I had the gift of healing. This is really pride. So I made an act of contrition and I said to Jesus, I will never, ever mention it again, Lord. And I left the chapel. I thought, I'm definitely not telling the nuns or Father. And I never said anything about it. And on Pente the next day, there was a, a prayer meeting at Holy Name Academy. And Sister Emmeline, whom I don't know if you knew Sister Emmeline. She was I, really, I really once, she got me I, into the renewal. She was a, a, an elderly sister, and she was miraculously healed of MS overnight. She was the first person I had ever seen a young boy prayed with her, and she, she thought he was, she said to him, I'm old, I, Jesus finished with me now, and she got miraculously healed. So, mm. but anyway, when she said to me at the prayer meeting on Pentecost Sunday, I'd love you reach to pray with this little boy. He has a very bad foot. And I was going to tell her, say, why did you ask? But something stopped me, and we prayed with the child, but I never told anything. We found out the child was healed. But I left Tampa to fly to California to go to college, your summer school in uh, Orange County. And uh, I'm in, um, there's a prayer meeting on in the parish, so, or a speaker, and I said, oh, I'll go to this talk, because, you know, I was already in the renewal, and uh, at the talk, I'm sitting beside uh, a minister. I didn't know, I knew he wasn't Catholic, but he was dressed in clerics. And uh, I was minding my own business, listening to the talk, and he's there, and he puts his hand over to me like this, and he, he st just like that, and he said to me, you have the gift of healing. You know you have it. Jesus told you about it. When are you going to use it? And it's a terrible thing to, prof to confess, but I was brought up in Northern Ireland, so he was a Protestant, I was a Catholic, and I thought, well, how did he know? He doesn't know anything about Catholics. <laughs> and then I said, he's a mind-controlled reader. Oh. And I said to him, oh, I couldn't accept the gift of healing. I said, my bishop wouldn't accept it. My mother general, I went down the list. <laughs> and he just looked at me with the most penetrating eyes, and he said to me, God never forces, but he makes his will known. And I, he left. And it didn't faze me too much. I went to college. And it was the time of the hippies, and we were in the full in the habit at the time, you know. We'd be sitting in these big classes, you know, and we'd have these projects to do. And I'd have these fellows with their long hair and earrings around me. And they'd be saying to me, Sister, you're a nun. What's in your hands? There's some strange sensation in you. And they would say things, but it didn't mean anything to them, because I didn't even know they were Christian. But every time they would say it, I was thinking, is God really trying to talk to me through it? So going home on the plane back to Florida, I made a deal with Jesus. I said, now, Jesus, I can't go home and tell the people I have the gift of healing. You think I bought it over in California? <laughs> <laughs> I said, but I make a deal. You do the telling, and I'll do the praying. There <laughs> Can you, you go. imagine? <laughs> so anyway, I came back, and I don't think this part's in the book, but I came back to Florida, and I was asked to give a talk to the Women's Guild which is not a very big group in a parish in Tampa. And I thought, well, talk about prayer, because they'd heard me. You know, I, I talked about prayer, but never mentioned healing. So I go to the talk, and there's only about 20 women. So I give this, what I thought was wonderful talk in prayer. And in the middle of my talk, this woman stands up and bangs the door and walks out. Oh, she's troubled. <laughs> and, you know, I knew it because she made so much noise going out that she, I knew she didn't approve. So two days later, I get a phone call from the parish priest. The parish priest said, Sister Breach, you're over in my parish in the social hall, because they had it in the hall, you know. He said, listen, there is a woman, and I think she's a little bit off. He said, but she's been phoning me at 2 o'clock in the morning, telling me there's a nun in her room, and she can't get rid of her. And she, she, he said, would you ever go over and pay, pay a fire? and talk to her, because I don't know what to make out of her. 
And I tell you, Jeanette, I said, oh, Jesus, please don't have me roaming home this night time. <laughs> I said, you do the telling, I'll do the praying. <laughs> God, it's a great sense of humour, you know. <laughs> so anyway, I go to see this woman. And I'm a kind of suspicious myself, you see, but I thought. So when I saw her, she's the woman who banged the door and walked out. <laughs> and she said to me, now I have to tell you, sister. She said, I had seven, five, six, some miscarriages. I had one, I had one little girl, a tumour in the brain, migraine had you in the whole list. And she said, I used to be a Catholic. She said, I left the Catholic Church because the priest told me to offer it up. And she said, the doctors, nobody could do anything for me. She said, and my husband is a really good man. He's Baptist. But she said, I just had had it. So she said, about six weeks ago, I decided I'd send my one little girl to my sister's and I was going to commit suicide because she said life wasn't worth living and wasn't fair to my husband. So she said, I decided this is it. So she said she was able to get whatever she was going to do. And she said, but the child came home from school, how God works, with a notice uh, that was sent out to say that this uh, Breach McKenna, that no sister on it, just Breach McKenna, would be giving a talk on prayer and something else in, in the social hall. And this woman said, I hadn't been in church for years, and since it wasn't in the church, I thought, is this a man or a woman? What breed me? Because you know what the name meant. But she said, something prompted me and said, I'm going to go and see what it's like. But she said, I went. And when you were speaking, I already had planned that night to kill myself. But you were taking away my reasons by what you were saying about prayer. And I got so angry at you. She said, I don't know if you remember, I walked out. I was really angry. So I came home and I had already sent my child to stay with her, with my sister. My husband was out of town. She said, when I was about to take whatever drug mixture of them, she said, this nun appeared in the room and said to me, why are you doing this? Don't you know Jesus can help you? Jesus can help you. And she said, she turned her face against me, but she said, walls didn't bother me. <laughs> I was where she looked, I was there. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, oh dear, geez. So I said to her, I was really nervous when she said this to me. So I sa said to her, well, you know, I'll say a prayer with you. And I'll tell you, Jeanette, it wasn't my faith now, I'll tell you, but I was so shocked. I put my hands on her and I, I said a prayer with her. and. The first thing that happened was her face lit up with hope. And it was as if Jesus showed me that I was being willing to be to pray, even if I was struggling, but that he injected. It was like somebody getting an injection and waking up and saying, do you think it's possible Jesus could help me? Oh. About a week later, or less than a week, I got the flu, the last one I had, thank God, and she called me up. She went back to church, she was totally transformed. And it was after that that I said, well, I can't, I can't do, I'll have to keep going. And then a woman flew in from Canada, Quebec. She came to a prayer meeting at the, at the Franciscan Retreat Centre. And she stood up in the middle of a talk and told me that she was sent to tell me that I was using excuses and that <laughs> I, all kinds of things. So after that, I thought, well, that's it, Lord. And what I used, which is, you know, even in religious life, you can, you know, how the enemy can deceive you. I was using obedience, that I was under obedience to my spirit. But I told her in such a way that I wanted her to say no. And then I was using the church, that I was defending the church and I couldn't do it. But it really was, Jesus then showed me in prayer, that it was like the day I took my vows. You know, I was dressed as a bride when I was a young girl and given away at the altar like a bride to Jesus. And you say, this is your life, you know, the given of the Lord. But the Lord showed me a vision right after all these things happened. And I was struggling with, how do I go? I have 56 kindergartners. Mm -hmm. And how do you do a ministry of healing with 56 kindergartners? And the Lord showed me this little house and he's knocking at the door. You know, sometimes you see those pictures of Jesus knocking yes. and the handle is inside. Yes. There's no handle on the outside. And I opened the door and I said, Jesus, come in. And he comes in. And he walks through the house and he comes to a door, private property, do not enter. And he, right, I could see him in, the, my, in this inner vision saying, 
but Breach, why can I not go in there? And I said, but I give you every other part of the house. And he said, but that's the place I really want. Mm -hmm. And when you give me that, you know true freedom. And he showed me, it was my reputation, what people thought about me, false pride, false humility, false everything. And I was, it was all a cover. And it was like somebody said, to be a fool for Jesus, not to be trying to look good in other people's eyes. So that day, I made the commitment. I said, Jesus, I don't know how my congregation, I don't know what's going to happen, but I surrender to you. And you know the beautiful thing is that my, my first trip back to Ireland, uh, I prayed with um, um, some, some lady that found out that, about my work and some lady got miraculously healed that was a very prominent person. And that the order then, the sister came to me. Have you to take a little break? Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to, sister. I don't want to. And I know that you all don't want for a break either. But we're going to be right back with Sister Breege McKenna, our guest today, author of this beautiful book, Miracles Do Happen. It's available for you at EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. And let me tell you, a DVD of today's program is also available for you there. And I really encourage you to get Sister's book, to get the DVD. And this is a great way that you can open the hearts of so many people through what great gifts Sister has been given by God. So we encourage you to get out to EWTNRC.com and get a copy of the book. We're coming right back. Stay with us. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Sister Breege McKenna. She's the author of this book, Miracles Do Happen, and yes, they do. Sister has seen many, witnessed many, and been used by God for many to happen. This beautiful book chronicles a lot of those miraculous moments, and in addition to that, Sister gives us great insight about our relationship with God. It is a transforming book, and I encourage you to get a copy of it at EWTN's religious catalog. It's EWTNRC.com, the home of holy reminders. Do get a copy for your Yourself. And I've been encouraging you, make a gift of this to, to others, especially those who, who you think might be waning in their faith or who are going through a very difficult time. It is the kind of a book that will instill hope in them, that virtue will be still uh, stirred up within them and great things can happen for them. So it's Miracles to Happen at EWTNRC.com. And you know, sister, it's true because you were talking about the woman uh, who was going to commit suicide and heard you speak and then apparently you bilocated. I mean, I don't know what other <laughs> term to call it. You were there in a room and every time she turned around, you were right there and wouldn't leave her. And you prayed with her uh, uh, after father petitioned you to go visit her after that particular evening. And, and hope, you said that was the first thing that mm. lit up her faith. Hope, and which I, we don't realize, you know, I got a beautiful insight just a couple of months ago. I was uh, praying and uh, especially since COVID, yeah. you know, uh, I've, I started uh, to um, do Skype and FaceTime worldwide, mm -hmm. you know, people calling and all. And uh, I realized how, Jeanette, all over the world, I'd be in 10 countries, sitting in my chapel, looking at Jesus and praying with him and talking to them, and the lack of hope to spare. Mm -hmm. And I felt the Lord saying, you know, the, the resurrection was the victory. But now what people need is the resurrection of their heart. Oh. Because the heart is dying for lack of hope. The, the, everything around them is... is it, it, generating despair and mm -hmm. it's getting worse and what are you going to do and all the bad news and I felt the Lord saying to me you know we Christians like you're doing on with Woman of Grace programs and all we have to be people who resurrect the human hearts for Jesus yes and and I thought that's what uh, Father Pablo and myself at our missions now we give parish missions mm -hmm. we're giving one um, next month in Georgia and we give some during Lent and all in Florida that to to look at the people because they're so discouraged with all that's going on in the world and I keep saying to them when your heart is resurrected full of hope you don't matter at the end is going to be great because Jesus won the victory that's right yeah and that is so important and you talk you know in your book about hope but you also talk about expectant faith yes. and and this is what we need today especially I've got a little acronym for hope do you want to hear it yes okay so the H is hold on to the truths of the faith the O is own the challenge. The P is persevere in prayer and patience. And the E is expect God to intervene. 
beautiful. You like that? Oh, that's beautiful. Well, thank you. And I think that that's what we have to do. That's how hope is enkindled yes. in us, right? Yes. We don't give up. We persevere and move forward in the yeah, Lord, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's so needed today. It is. I want to share a little story, too, uh, because I want uh, all of our viewers to know that not only have I read about your miracles, but I've experienced them. And this one involves my one granddaughter who was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when she was 18 months old. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, Patty Mansfield, a friend of ours, yes. right, uh, made arrangements because you were going to be in New Orleans at one of the Catholic Charismatic Renewals there, Renewal Conferences, uh, for me to bring uh, Carmen with me and you would pray with her and Father Kevin would pray with her. Yes. And so I did that, but I had had a dream the night before. And the dream the night before was that uh, Carmen had, was sitting at her little girl, you know, toy table. You know how they have those little children's tables. Yes. And Jesus came into the room and he sat in a chair and he took his, her little foot oh, yeah, into his hand. Do you remember this yes, now? Yes, yes. And he, and he healed her and she was completely healed. So I knew when we left to go, she would be healed. When we got there, you said, oh, Jeanette, I think, you said in your beautiful Irish yeah. robe, oh, Jeanette, I think I'll let Father, Father Kevin heal, uh, pray for her, but I will be praying with him. So you stood to his side, and he sat down in the chair. Carmen was sitting he in her, her, yeah, and he took her little foot into his hand, and she never lost her gaze of his eyes. She yeah. stared into his eyes, and he stared back, just like in the dream that I had had. And you, you said, oh, it's finished, she's healed. And indeed, she is. Isn't that beautiful? You know, and I mean, what a wonderful way. But it reminds me of the gift of the priesthood. Yes. And of course, Father Kevin has gone on to his eternal reward. But you worked with him for what? You told me 45, 45 years, Almost right? 45 years, yeah. yes. He was, he was such a gift. You know, he was one of 15. Yes. 12 boys and three girls in mm -hmm. his family. But I remember that day well. And I remember it was very unusual because Father Kevin didn't do that. And he took the little baby foot in and held him in it. Yes. But um, he also, uh, talking about healing, he taught me one of the most beautiful things about the anointing of the sick. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen so many miracles. And now Father Pablo, the priest I'm working with now that Jesus sent me, he, he already, we've seen miracles through the sacrament of the anointing when people have, I mean, cancer, people with all kinds of arthritis. And I think we don't realize that the Catholic Church's sacraments are living encounters with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say to people, you know, it, if only we could recognize that we meet the person of Jesus, that he's a living person. And the more you talk about expecting faith, the more you believe, um, the more you're going to get uh, abundant graces more than you ever expected. That's true. You know? And you mentioned in your book something about that. You talk about faith. Uh, and today, you know, we're very riveted towards feelings. And you said faith is not a feeling. feeling. You said that over and over yes. again. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is something that we do. It's something that we we operate in. Yes, and, and I think, you know, people people will come to me for to, me to pray with them. And I remember a girl coming to me, and she had very bad cancer. And uh, she said to me, Sister Breach, please, I, I've only a short time to live. And I said to her, people will tell you today, it's not politically correct, but I tell them the kingdom of God doesn't talk about political correctness. My mission is to get you to heaven and to get you to know Jesus. So I always say, if they're coming to me and they're Catholic, I said to you, you're Catholic, yes. Do you go to mass? And she said to me, no, because it's boring. She said, I don't, get a, I don't feel anything at mass. And so... Five minutes I sat her down and I said to her, now, I explained the whole thing. I said, it has nothing to do with feelings. That priest is ordained by, the, by God through the church. And I said, when the consecration comes, Jesus, the person of Jesus, you're sitting in the pew, you may not feel it, but the miracle happens. And I said, it's not feelings. I said, if you only, you know, live on your feelings, you'll never accomplish anything in life. So I said, now I want you to go out. It was like Saturday. I was giving her a treat in Australia. I said, go to f 4 o'clock mass over there. And she had five, ch four children and a husband, and she was dying, very swollen. So I, I said, don't be emphasizing feelings. You uh, Make an act of faith and tell Jesus you love him. I said, I don't feel it at times. I said, anything when I'm praying with people. But I make the decision. And I said, that's where Jesus will give you a, a, a great grace. Because if you just went on all the emotions, it's all emotional. 
So she, I said to her, but go to confession and be at the Mass. Her, her husband and herself had no impediment. There was no reason why they couldn't go to Mass and communion. So she went home all excited because I'd said to her, when you walk up the church, you are going to meet a person, the same person in the Bible. And I said, he, Jesus will give you more. You're afraid of dying. You're afraid of them. She was all these fears. I said, why would you come to me? I'm just an instrument when the Catholic Church has promised us. So on a Sunday evening, she came back to me. She'd gone to confession. She'd gone to Mass with the husband. And she said, Sister, I went to Mass all my, you know, as a young person at home, and her mother would, everybody practiced. But when she left home, went to college, and just fell away from the church. She said, you know, yesterday was my first time ever going to Mass. And I said to her, really? She said, yeah, because other times I went because you fulfill an obligation, and it's just what you do. But she said, when I walked up to receive Holy Communion, I was so excited to meet Jesus. And she said, Sister, I don't know if I'm healed because, you know, I have very bad cancer and I have several things wrong with her. And she said, um, but when I took the sacred host, I just had such a joy and a peace. It wasn't a fee I couldn't tell you it was a feeling, but it was something happened to me. So she, three days later, she went to the clinic and on the newspaper, from the newspaper, she was declared healed. She's oh, my goodness. Healed. And look, she's, uh, how often I say to people, you know, it's like having a fridge full of rich food and dying of starvation. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, the bishops this year have put out this three year for the, for the Eucharist. And I'm so delighted because I talk about the Eucharist all the time to Catholics. Yes. And I tell them, you know, mm -hmm. that um, it's the best encounter with Jesus. Yes, it is, Sister, and you remind us of that so many times in the book. And when we come back from our break, let's talk about the Eucharist and let's talk about adoration because so much happens there. Friends, once again, the book, Miracles Do Happen, written by our guest today, Sister Bridget McKenna, is available for you at EWTN's Religious Catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. Stay tuned. More coming with Sister Bridget. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today, Sister Bridget McKenna. She has given us this book, Miracles Do Happen. It's available for you at EWTN's Religious Catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. We want to send you right out to get a copy of it, so please do. This book, I think, is a transforming instrument of God, right? It, it opens your eyes to marvels and wonders, but more than that, it opens up your heart to receive our Lord very very truly. So we invite you to get a copy of it. Again, EWTN's Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, and DVDs of today's program are also available for you there. You know, Sister, you were sharing with us a, the beautiful story about this woman who was riddled with cancer, four little children close to death. Uh, you, you encourage her. She comes to you for healing. She's not been to Mass in many years. Uh, you encourage her to go back, and you uh, so rightly tell her you're going to meet a person. She receives communion after going to confession, and she is declared mm. healed. Medically. Uh, medically mm -hmm. declared healed, and it makes the front pages of the newspaper. And this is what we underestimate. We underestimate the goodness of God, the providence of God, and the power of the Eucharistic presence of our Lord. This this is the key yes. nugget of your ministry of yes, healing. Yes, uh, and that all happened, you know, um, Jeanette, I went to Lourdes uh, after I received the gift of healing. I became very aware that people make you into almost like a false god and you become a celebrity and people want to touch you and, you know, you could very easily, you can see where Satan could use it to make you pompous and to make you think that it's you and, and to get you on the fringes of the church where, you know, um, I had the sense, you know, people are running after me all the time, and they mean well, but I don't feel that I'm, I'm leading them. Many of them are not Catholic, they don't practice, they don't go to Mass, but they come to Sister Bridge. So I went to, um, to Lourdes to pray to Our Lady how to stay in the heart of the Catholic Church. What, what could she teach me as a mother? And so I went to Lourdes, and uh, I certainly had a great experience there and met people from my own town there that I ended up ministering in Lourdes. But 
uh, when I came home, I went and I don't know if this is, this is in the book, I think. I went to Father Rick Thomas out at the, at the yes, dock. Yes, yes. And it was there. And I said, I've only a few, like a, a, an afternoon, Father, and the next morning. And he said, that's all we need, Bridge. Come across to Juarez and pray with um, the people at the dump there. And he brought me. So I'm going there with the concept. These people are very poor. Uh, they, they don't know anything about, I didn't even think that we're going to have the Eucharist. So Father said to me, he brought young Mexicans from El Paso, Mexican-American, the music ministry. We went out there. And it was at that uh, mass that I think I related in my book where uh, Father said, we're going to have mass now. And just when the mass was about to start is when this little lady yes. came up with a little boy all covered with burns and everything. And there was no medicine. We couldn't, uh, we had nothing. So he said, let's pray with her. So he said a short prayer. And then he put her on under the little boy under the table, left him lying on the poncho that the woman carried him. And we started Mass. He's under the altar now. He's under the altar. And I'm standing to the side, because it's actually on a big dump. Just every place you looked, there was people were standing, you know, just around. So I stood to the side. And when I came to the Gloria, that people were singing and praising God. And, you know, this is what, when, when Jesus said, you think like the mind of the world, you know, I was thinking like what the world tells us is, you, well, how can you praise God? They don't have anything. They don't have, they don't have the necessities of life, even homes or anything. And I felt that word, you know, if, this, if, if my people don't praise me, the stones will cry out. Well, here in war is in the dump where these people are praising God. Came to the consecration of the Mass, and when Father said the words of consecration, and he had a huge, large host, I had my head bowed. And I looked up to look at the host, and two things happened. First, I remember seeing Jesus look with his hands out, come to me. All It was so clear to me, I'm looking at the host. But when I looked at the people, they were all prostrate. And then their faces came up, and they looked at the host. And I was looking at them, and the sense they know this is the person of Jesus. And that day, I saw miracles happen. That little boy was healed, a little Down syndrome child was healed. Loads of miracles. It was like a display of God's power. I was on the mountain for like hours with Father Rick. I hadn't prayed with anybody. Hmm. And that night when I went back to El Paso, in the middle of the night, I couldn't sleep. You know how I was disturbed, but it wasn't a bad disturbance. It was, why did God bring me? I brought up in Ireland, went to Mass since I was a child, I went to Mass in the convent all these years. And why would God bring me here and show me this display? At three o'clock in the morning, I knelt at the side of the bed. And it's then that I started to pray and I felt the Lord said, you know, you asked my mother hmm. to bring me. And then I, I got the sense of the Lord saying, you know, people will come to you. They will go to see signs and wonders in the world, but they will not come to me. And I'm on the altars of the world and in the tabernacle. I want you to go out into the world. And from now on, I want you to draw them to me in the Eucharist and I will heal them. And you know, Jeanette, all these years, Father Kevin and myself, we would have, like, we had 300,000 in Chester Cove, out in a big at the shrine there with a healing service, all over Latin America. And now Father Pablo and myself do the same. And last week, or a couple of weeks ago, we were down in Costa Rica at, at the Indigenous Zone, just about two weeks ago. And um, I have them up on my website. These, the little children, we, Father stood with the monsters, and these little Indian children came up, and they're standing looking, and I put my hand, and, and they're looking at Jesus. And you think to yourself, if we could only s realize that this is the same Jesus looking at these little children and the grace that's going through them. And so that's what we do, and we see miracles. I've seen, I could write 10 books on the miracles, but. I just tell the people, give God the glory, because why, why should be surprised? Because it is Jesus, it's his real presence. Yeah. So that's and what I do most now, and it's, I don't lay hands. People ask me, you know, especially when I go on radio, when I, you know, secular talk shows and that, they ask me all these questions, you know, wouldn't you like to be a priest? And, you know, do you lay hands on everybody in the church? And, all? and I say, no. I said, Jesus is there. Why would I be laying hands? Because he told me to go out and preach him. And it's another teaching on the proclamation of the gospel. When you teach, like I watch people. I watched a little African boy as I was preaching. He's animated. And 
and he gets healed of paralysis because of hearing that this is Jesus. We need this message so, so desperately today. I know. And you're bringing it to so many. And I know that the Lord is going to continue to use you because he's given you such a powerful gift that comes by way of his son through the Holy Spirit, of course. Yes. And, uh, you know, I love the fact that you said that, um, you know, Our Lady, the Lord said to you, well, you, you, you went to my mother. Yes. I, you, we can never love Our Lady oh, more than no. our Lord loves her. She's the woman of grace. She is the <laughs> woman of grace, yes. absolutely. Well, thank you for being with us today. And we're going to do four additional programs with Sister Breege. And I know that uh, as we continue to move forward through those programs, the Lord is going to touch you in a deep way. I know he already has. We want to send you out to EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. The book is Miracles to Happen by Sister Breege McKenna. It's a beautiful book. I can't say enough about it. I've been telling you it's a transforming book, and it's true. It is. EWTNRC.com, the home of Holy Reminders. We also want to invite you to get by our website, womenofgrace.com. We have all kinds of beautiful resources available for you there. In addition, it lets you know where our events are going to be and what they're going to be about. We'd love to see you at one of those events. We want to remind you, too, that uh, at our website, we have an opportunity for you to see all of the programs that we've produced and all of our retreat talks uh, are there for you. Our webinars are there for you. It's a great way to come to a deeper understanding of this great gift of our faith that God's given to us. Until we're together again, may God bless you. Bye-bye now.